Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, I'm talking with Sam Burns from Mill Street Research. We'll get his take on this overall environment, particularly the commodity space, which has been a challenging environment, still an incredibly strong uh, year-to-date return, but showing a lot of short-term weakness here in recent weeks and months. We'll talk about that rotation, what that means relative to some other potential bets we could be making. The major equity average is sort of easing off going into the close. This after bouncing up earlier. What is the next leg for the S&P? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the final bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in these markets using the power of stock charts, using data visualization techniques, the technical analysis toolkit to better quantify investor behavior, better analyze market trends, and respect the lessons of market history. It's been said those that uh, fail to learn the lessons of market history are doomed to repeat it. So let's try to uh, avoid that uh, negative uh, outcome and focus on what we can learn from previous market cycles. It's good to be back with you live today. We had a couple of uh, days off earlier this week, and we're great to be. Uh, it's great to be talking about the markets here real time right after the close. The S and P settling in down about half a percent around thirty eight hundred. Uh, and what we're going to do today is uh, focus on a couple different pieces of information. We'll dig into the S&P 500 chart, some of the key sectors and groups driving that performance of the major averages in uh, in recent days and recent weeks. We're going to look at breadth indicators in a little more detail today as well. Talk about things like the bullish percent index, um, percent of stocks above key moving averages, look at advanced decline lines, try to understand how this recent price action fits into the big picture. The short answer is we got a lot of choppy sideways sort of action. The market really hasn't made any significant ground on one side or the other, we'll talk about what conditions we would need to see to start to convince us that bulls and or bears are really starting to take control. We have a great guest lined up for you today, Sam Burns from Mill Street Research. Coming up uh, the remainder of this week on Thursday the 14th, we have Carolyn Baroden. Carolyn is a, an expert in Fibonacci analysis, so very interested to see what kind of levels are bubbling up in her analysis of the major market averages. Next week on Tuesday the 19th, we have options expert Jay Soloff. And then on Wednesday, July 20th, Todd Sohn from Strategus in New York. Let's continue on today's show, talking about this uh, market environment. Uh, the S&P 500, as I mentioned, easing off a bit going into the close. Let's take a step back and uh, try to connect today's movements with the big picture. S&P closing just above 3,800. Now, this is obviously well uh, off of the uh, the all-time highs at the beginning of this year, really in, uh, in January. Although, as we've talked about many times, I think the markets for all intents and purposes, the equity markets, topped out in November. And from there, we started to see that decline of sorts, particularly in breadth indicators, which is where we're going to focus a little bit later today. Mid caps and small caps down as well. The VIX easing off uh, as well. And this is a great day to sort of reflect on the fact that the S&P 500, the equity markets, and the VIX measure volatility are not a perfect inverse relationship. A lot of people tend to think of it that way, probably oversimplistically, um, which is okay because in general, when stocks go higher, volatility tends to lessen. When stocks sell off, people kind of panic. The volatility increases. So in general, you'll have that uh, inverse relationship. But it doesn't mean on a particular day that volatility is going to do one particular thing or the other just because stocks are doing something else. And today, we have uh, prices coming down, volatility coming down uh, as well. We'll try to get to a chart of that a little later if we can. Kind of an interesting couple of days for interest rates with 10-year yields uh, down right around 290. This is after spiking up earlier in the day. Now, we had inflation numbers that came out uh, before the uh, the U.S. equity open, uh, which certainly impacted things uh, at the beginning of the day. So bond prices a little bit higher. The dollar index off just a bit, about 0.2% using the UUP, which is a buller, bullish dollar ETF. Gold, silver, both up today. Gold about half a percent, silver 1.4% using the common ETFs that we quote. Energy prices overall a little bit higher as well. The energy sector was third from the top when we're looking at the 11 S&P sectors. We'll circle back there in just a second. Bitcoin and Ether continuing to chop around. The last couple of days have been very, very volatile. I, you know, I'm looking at these charts and I think 
one of the ways you disconnect from the noise of the market is by focusing on particular levels. The market can chop all around. You can have upswings and downswings on any time frame. At the end of the day, the question is, what sort of ground are you really making relative to some key levels? And I'm looking at Ethereum, looking at Ether prices. I'm thinking about the 1,000 level, which is a big round number. You can see in the last 24 hours, we kind of came down around 1010 and then rotated back to the upside. We're currently around 1080 for, uh, for Ether. Bitcoin, on the other hand, continues to attempt to break back about above 20,000 but unable to do so. Let's actually go there first and look at uh, looked at some uh, a crypto chart or two, and then we'll look at the S and P five hundred next. You know, my my sort of base uh, base case, meaning sort of my general thesis on what's happening with cryptocurrencies, is you're in a broad pattern of distribution, and that in my is not an opinion. That's a fact. If you if you take price as fact, is if you look at the trends, right? Look at what the trajectory of Bitcoin has been in. Uh, for the last six to 12 months. And, and there's no denying that there's been quite the pattern of distribution. But what's interesting about Bitcoin, and I apologize, I feel like I need to start clean, wipe this entire slate clean and start with a, a fresh clean chart, which I might do later today. But overall, there's sort of a stepwise motion. You have this uh, distribution phase and then a bit of consolidation, even a, a brief rally, and then the next distribution down to support. Then we chop around. Here it was 30,000 back in May. In early June, we sold off to the next sort of uh, step down, which is right around 20,000. If you look at the last four weeks, we've basically been rotating around 20,000. It's similar to the chart of the S&P 500. You have up days and down days, upswings and downswings, but at the end, you're going that painful third direction. Remember, markets just don't go up or down. They can go up or down or sideways. And a lot of asset classes right now are in that painful third direction, which feels challenging because somehow no one's right, unless you're an options trader with some sort of strangle on so that you're benefiting from uh, the market not going anywhere. Otherwise, we're all just sort of waiting to see the next indication. The concern I have on the chart of Bitcoin, on the chart of Ether, and some Litecoin and some of the other um, uh, more liquid coins that we track is that this is all just the latest consolidation before the next leg down. Now, the way you validate that the next leg down may be beginning is you start to break down through uh, key support levels. So with Bitcoin, it's going back to around 17,500. That was a couple of weeks ago. That was the low in mid-June. We can hold that level overall. This is, is still, I, I think you could classify this as a consolidation phase. If you start breaking below there, you have to start looking even further on the chart. I was told never confuse the bottom of the page with support. So markets can go lower than you expect. They can certainly go higher than we uh, you expect uh, as well. So focus on a key line in the sand at which point you uh, you agree to revisit a particular uh, position or particular thesis. That brings us to the chart of the S&P 500. Uh, you know, thinking of Bitcoin in sort of that sell-off then consolidation phase, I think I would describe the action of the S&P 500 over the last six weeks as essentially that as well, right? If you look in uh, early, uh, sorry, early May, we were selling off to the low around 3,800. That was a key Fibonacci support level we talked about uh, for quite some time. That's a 38.2% retracement from March 2020 to January 2022. From there, we retraced about 38.2% of that most recent sell-off to around 4150, and then rotated lower to make a new low just below 3650 just a couple of weeks ago in mid uh, in mid June. From there, we've sort of been chopping around, and so you can label this a number of different ways. It's not a really particular clean price pattern, I don't think necessarily, uh, but it's certainly a consolidation pattern. If you look at where we bounced around 3800, 3810, we'll call it in uh, in mid May. It's kind of where we've been rotating around. Think of that as a midpoint of the last couple of weeks. And we've sort of been undershooting and overshooting that median price, that sort of midpoint. So what happens, I would, I, I think with a lot of, uh, you know, if you think of, talk to an equity investor, a, a fundamentally oriented investor, they'll talk about valuations, right? Uh, PE ratio, a price to book, a price to sale, some level uh, at which investors are willing to pay for a certain amount of earnings or revenues or whatever it is. Uh, and in general, the valuation will kind of remain stable. And then you see sort of things settle in. And that means that the stock is priced pretty well for what the stock is uh, or the expectations of growth and earnings and sales and uh, and so forth. It's kind of what the S&P looks like, sort of like we've figured out that the S&P is worth around 3,800, 3,810. And now we just keep overshooting and undershooting that. John Bollinger told me a long time ago that big moves are usually preceded by a period of lower volatility, right? It's all about a, a pendulum of high volatility, sudden movements, and low volatility, sort of consolidation periods. We're in one of those consolidations, which means we need to wait to see which way the market breaks. Do we break above 
the upper end of this uh, this current range, or do you break below the lower end? I would I would uh, um, assume that whichever way we break that direction of momentum, that next big thrust, it's probably going to be what pushes the S and P to its next. Uh, I would assume further uh, movement in that uh, direction of momentum. That's usually what happens when you have a period of lower volatility, which we're sort of seeing uh, right now. I promised to look at the VIX. So let's do that. Um, usually we talk about the VIX on Thursday, but I just want to check in where we're at. So we bounced up a little bit, right? The VIX uh, sort of bottomed out just around 25 here a couple of days ago, bounced off of that uh, overall. So we're well below sort of the mid, low mid 30s, which is where these sell-offs have traditionally uh, bounced uh, higher. We're right about here. If we would have a nice sell-off from where we're at right now, then all of a sudden this current sort of rally and a new move lower would line up pretty well with what we saw from mid-May to early June, where you saw the VIX come down to around 24, 25 uh, on, the, uh, on the rally to 41.50 or so. And then we started the next leg down, which means we're sort of in a very similar pattern to what we were uh, to where we were back there uh, about six weeks ago. It might be an interesting chart to, uh, to watch going forward as well. Let's take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with today's guest, Sam Burns. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. We appreciate you so much joining us every weekday after the close as we break down these markets using stock charts. A couple quick announcements before we get to today's guest, Sam Burns. First off, we welcome your questions. We welcome your feedback on the show, on our host, anything like that. But particularly, we're, uh, we're anxious for your questions because it helps us address the things that you're running into as you are trying to navigate these markets using the tools of the technical analyst. Our email is thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. We're on Twitter at FinalBarSCTV. We're on YouTube. Put a comment below the video you're watching on our Stock Charts YouTube channel. We'll gather all those questions and hope to answer one of yours live on the air on Friday's show of this week. Also go to stockchartstv.com. If you like this sort of discussion about market dynamics and technical analysis, how to think about these market events and put them into context, great uh, guest uh, uh, perspectives like Sam Burns and many others. They're all for free at stockchartstv.com or on your mobile device. Just search for Stock Charts TV on demand. I want to welcome on today's guest, Sam Burns. Sam is the chief strategist at Mill Street Research coming to us from Boston. Sam, it's good to see you. Welcome back to the show. Hey, Dave. Thanks. Good to see you too. I know we are entering uh, a beautiful period in the Boston area, the same here in Western Washington. So I, I, we're both smiling because of the decent weather we've seen. Are you smiling about the market environment is my first question. And we're going to start with the chart of the commodity index. Talk us through what you're seeing here. Yeah, so here it's, it's really the fact that uh, the big uptrend in commodities uh, that we've seen in the last you know, year or two, and particularly uh, you know, the six months through kind of late May, early June, has really turned, has broken down. I think that kind of is a, an indicator of a shift in their broader macro backdrop. Uh, it, it tells us that the uh, the economy is slowing, that the what the Fed and the, the fiscal policy have done are having an impact. People are, are responding to the, the high prices by pulling back on demand for a lot of the different things. And so I think it's going to shift the market narrative from being just inflation is running out of control. The Fed's got to keep raising rates to more of a, you know growth is going to slow uh, might slow too much. And the, you know, the monetary policy might have to adapt to that in the next few months. It's, it's amazing how much things have evolved. I feel like we've lived a lifetime of, of the markets just in 2022. But that, that rotation from incredibly strong commodities to all of a sudden incredibly weak commodities, talk about a, a huge rotation. Now, uh, help us make sense of that relative to sentiment. We're going to dig into sentiment uh, on tomorrow's show in a little more detail. What are you seeing with sentiment indicators here? Well, here it's just a couple of the, the, the widely watched uh, sentiment surveys, uh, investors intelligence and consensus, and both of them kind of give a similar picture that there's a lot of bearishness out there already, that a lot of the bad news that people are talking about and whether it's the you know, economy and earnings or, or what have you, uh, it, a lot of that may be already priced in to some degree. Uh, there's a lot, lot more bears than usual out there. We're back to levels that we've seen at previous troughs. Uh, it doesn't mean things can't get worse or the people can't get more bearish but it does tell you that we're pretty far along in the sort of sentiment cycle to some degree and, and dramatically different than we were, say, a year ago. 
it's uh, it's amazing how sentiment is obviously rotated from from super positive to all of a sudden super super negative. You know, we're entering into that period in the next uh, couple of weeks, Sam. We're, we're going into earnings season. We have another Fed meeting come up. There, there's no shortage of potential catalysts. What should investors be, uh, you know, expecting in the next couple of weeks? What will you be looking for to try to make sense of where we're at? Well, I think uh, earnings will be important just because there's a lot of people that think that uh, you know that they've got the earnings estimates have got to come down that the, the earnings are going to come in worse than expected. Mm-hmm. I'm a little less worried about that. Um, the concern, the bigger concern from a macro standpoint, is that the Fed will be sort of pushed into raising rates too far. Uh, and, and really push the economy into a recession when that may not really be necessary. And a lot of what they've already done is probably sufficient. So I think we're going to see a, a, a pretty good size rate hike in, here in July, maybe another one in September. But I think after that, things will start to slow down enough to, to make them you know, take a step back. Uh, so I think that's it's more uh, the monetary policy and the rates uh, that I'll be watching most closely. But I think for now, it's probably the sentiment has shifted toward thinking that uh, rates are going to top out in the next few months. It's interesting. We only have about a minute left, Sam. But when you're thinking about this trajectory in the markets, the sentiment obviously has become very, very negative. You're starting to see energy, which had been so good, sort of the late cycle leadership rotating lower. What should investors be doing now? Is this a time to be raising cash and be looking for the next opportunity higher? Is this a time to be just getting defensive and to park into relatively you know, low beta types of things? Where are you looking for opportunities given the environment you described there? Yeah, and no, I think it's you know I've been defensive um, you know in my you know reports to clients and things for for several months now and, and still are. I think it makes sense to be cautious. Uh, I think you know things like utilities have been looking better on our work um, as a place to kind of hide. Um, and I think uh, that that there's still uh, you know a fair amount of um, you know kind of caution about the cyclical outlook. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there might be you know places to start to pick where things are cheap. And uh, I think for instance, like energy will probably hold up better than maybe materials within the commodity space. So if you're looking for a relative play there. Um, and then I think, um, you know, that, that there's just a, a question of waiting for the market to come to a point where they think they've priced all the bad news in. I think you said it's still got to wait a little, little longer to get there. Uh, but I think we will probably, you know, by the end of the summer. Just to finish off then, uh, Sam, when you're looking at this market, obviously the s and come off quite a bit. We're currently around 3,800. What would you be looking for here to start to feel like a recovery was happening? What what is the opportunity? What, what is the signal? Is it is it just the S and P starting to rotate higher, representing some optimism? Is it a bottoming out of some of these sentiment indicators that you shared, or is it a particular movement in a uh, in a sector that uh, to watch? What would you be looking for as a sign of life from these markets here? Um, yeah, I think if you, if you get some uh, some better leadership from uh, the, the tech stocks, you know that that, that uh, had often been the leadership, and then some of the consumer stocks that have really you know uh, been under pressure. Uh, I think those would be a good sign that you start to see a little bit more uh, cyclical and growth leadership as opposed to sort of the defensive and and value leadership, which has been mostly commodities um, to some degree. I think that shift in leadership would tell you that uh, that, that things had changed and that people had maybe uh, adapted to this new environment of uh, you know potentially you know higher rates, but also uh, hopefully slowing inflation over the next six to twelve months. It's a lot to think about, Sam. Listen, it's great to see you. Thanks again for sharing some uh, perspective with us. Stay, uh, stay well and stay safe there in New England. We'll talk to you again soon. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. That's Sam Burns. Sam is the uh, chief strategist at Mill Street Research coming to us from, uh, from Boston. I like his take. I, you know, Sam has such a level-headed way of describing what's going on. I feel like a lot of investors get so caught up in the short-term movements, all of the uncertainty. At the end of the day, it's all about looking at the evidence and seeing when things start to improve. And I love his comments at the end. What would you look for? It's you know starting to see some improvement in some of the areas, some of the growth-oriented leadership, things like technology, like consumer. Not really seeing a lot of a lot of merge there just yet. We talked about some of the fang and fang like stocks and looking to see some rotation higher. Once you do, uh, it would be uh, it would be hard to remain too negative uh, given the potential of those uh, stocks to move the benchmarks higher. Great take there, and some great uh, great uh, ideas from Sam Burns at Mill Street Research. Let's continue on today's show. Let's go on to our next segment talking about breadth. Our segment banking on breadth is where we dig into some of the breadth data. Uh, you know, when we think about the major averages, we look at the S&P 500 currently above 3,800. We look at the NASDAQ, sort of unchanged, not too much of a, of a change from uh, yesterday, but more of a growth-oriented benchmark. Uh, but at the end of the day, those movements and those benchmarks are driven by individual stocks. Let's look at the names and the groups that comprise those stocks and see what sort of evidence we can uh, we can derive. 
I have a chart list just of breadth indicators. And if you are a Stock Charts member, by the way, pretty much all the charts that I show here, uh, you, you can access either create yourself, of course, but a lot of these are already preloaded uh, or can be preloaded on your Stock Charts login. So if you're not familiar with these, if you go to your dashboard, if you go to where it says chart lists, you're going to have a list of these. I have an insane number that I, it's on my endless uh, to-do list to clean some of these up. But at the bottom, you have this guy called Managed Chart Lists. If you go there, you'll find one called, I think it's called like Dave Keller's Morning Coffee Routine or something kind of like that. If you install that, this breadth uh, checklist or a breadth chart list, our sentiment chart list we'll probably review tomorrow and many more are all included in your stock charts uh, login. So you can look at the charts, live versions of the charts that we're talking about on the show uh, every day. Let's go through a couple of these now. This was one, uh, the last live show we did, I featured this chart, if I remember right. This is looking at cumulative advanced decline lines. So one of the basic ways to look at breadth is to look at the movement in a benchmark. In this case, we're looking at the S&P on a closing basis only for the last year. And then we're looking at the cumulative advanced decline line. So every day, how many stocks are closing up? That's the advancers. How many stocks closing down? That's the decliners. Take the difference between advancers versus decliners. Do you have a net advanced decline value. And that's the uh, number will be quoted on financial media. A lot of times on financial television, they'll talk about advances versus decliners, up versus down, something like that. The trick though, to think about it over time is to look at a cumulative version. So keep accumulating those up and down values over time. Uh, and you can track the trend in advancers versus decliners. It's an equal weighted measure. So Amazon has the same weight as Carnival Cruise Lines and whatever other names are in these uh, particular universes that we have here. So it's a great way of just looking at the overall trend in a lot of individual names and see whether there's strength or weakness in uh, control. Here we have the uh, New York Stock Exchange common stock only very close to making a new 52-week low today. So we're actually coming off a bit uh, and uh, the value itself doesn't mean a ton because it's more of a cumulative value that's uh, uh, that's going on over time. So it's all about the trend. Where are we at relative to previous swing highs and previous swing lows? You can see we've rotated back down to the lowest levels we've seen so far in 2022. My argument for what would you need to see to turn more optimistic about the market environment and upside opportunities, I would tell you the first thing is the advanced decline line for the New York Stock Exchange has to stop going down, has to start turning higher. We're maybe stabilizing here, but overall, we're not really getting uh, any sort of move, uh, enough of a move to the upside to consider any sort of uh, all clear there. We then have the same thing for the S&P 500, for mid caps, and for small caps. All four of these, by the way, remain below their 50-day moving average. That, to me, is a sign of overall market weakness as opposed to overall, uh, overall market strength. Let's look at what percent of the S&P members are above their 200-day moving average. It's right at 20%. So that means only 20%, one out of five S&P members are currently above their 200-day moving average. That means almost all of them, four out of five of them, are below their 200-day moving average. So just like the S&P, well below its 200-day, most stocks are in a very similar uh, condition. When the market starts to improve, this indicator starts to go higher. And if and when it would get above 50%, that's where it looks more like it did for much of 2020 and uh, all of 2021. When most stocks are in an uptrend, most stocks are making higher highs and higher lows, and they remain above their 200-day moving average. That's the sign of a healthy bull market environment. We are very far from that sort of uh, all-clear signal. On a shorter term basis, we can look at how many stocks are above their 50-day moving average. It's right around the same value, right around 20%. Now, that's up from about 5% about a month ago, mid-June. It was very, very low, down to single digits. Here's the thing. Before we get too excited that, okay, these indicators became super bombed out, that means this is most likely a bottom. We rally from here. That could be the case, but unlikely. And the reason is this. In extended bear market phases, these indicators can get down to single digits, if not zero, and sit there for months. And if you look back to 2009, if you look back to 2002, uh, even maybe 2015, I don't have the data in front of you, but if you look back to some of those previous more extended bear market phases, those indicators can get a lot lower uh, than they are right now. Speaking of lower numbers, we have the bullish percent index on the S&P 500. It looks at all the 500 stocks in the S&P, how many of them are in a bullish point and figure pattern, meaning the most recent signal has been a buy signal. It's currently around 32% about one in three, which means two thirds of the S&P currently in a sell signal on their point and figure charts, about one third uh, in, a, uh, in a buy signal. That's up from around uh, you know 12% uh, 
a couple of weeks ago, which is encouraging. Right? That's been it's certainly been an improvement, but we're still very low relative to where we've been over the last uh, couple of years. And if you look back over market history, this is certainly more characteristic of bear market phases than bull market phases. So just like the sentiment uh, indicators that uh, Sam Bird shared with us a little bit ago, you're fe- seeing the same uh, sort of similar uh, bearish pattern on uh, a lot of these breadth indicators, really not um, you know, changing the trend, not indicating a change in trend, but more validating the fact that this is uh, is and has been and most likely will continue to be a more of a protracted bear market phase. Next, we have the NASDAQ 100 bullish percent index. So before we're looking at the S&P 500, now we're looking at the 100 stocks in the NASDAQ 100. What percent of them are in a bullish uh, point and figure chart? This is an interesting one because it's right around 50%. It's been that way for the last couple of weeks. It was down to just below 10% in mid-June. It's jumped up quite a bit, but now it's stabilized. So I talked about the S&P sort of been in a choppy sideways environment. I talked about the major averages, even Bitcoin, a lot of uh, you know uh, risk measures uh, are sort of in sideways mode. They're in wait and see mode, which makes sense because we're sort of getting into earnings season. We're getting into another Fed meeting. We have a lot of potential catalysts. We're sort of in wait and see mode, I think, in a lot of ways as an equity market. If you look at the last couple of weeks on this bullish percent index, kind of mirrors the same indication, right about 50%. What I would be looking for here, do we see a breakout here, right? Do we get well above 50%, well below 50%? Which way does this line break? I think that will tell you all you need to know about the overall market environment. Because when this indicator starts to head down, particularly when it goes below 30%, this is pretty significant weakness in the growthy stuff that my guest today, Sam Burns, was talking about as needing to see for a recovery. So if you buy into the recovery thesis, if you think equities have bottomed out and you're looking for the major indexes to be making new highs here anytime soon, you really need to see the bullish percent index improve on the S&P, but also especially for the NASDAQ 100, really hasn't followed through enough to the upside just yet. We need to wrap today's show. Boy, 30 minutes goes by so quickly, and it's a blast to share some of these charts with you. We need to wrap today's show. Go to that three and three. Here's three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Chart number one, the S&P 500 bullish percent index. We talked in our sentiment, uh, excuse me, our breadth indicator focus today about some of the breadth indicators, things like percent above their moving averages, uh, the cumulative advanced decline lines. Bullish percent indexes are a great way to incorporate point and figure charts into your analysis. And here's why. Point and figure charts are designed to strip out the noise. Instead of plotting all these noisy minutes and days and everything uh, that normal bar charts would do. It strips all of that away and just looks purely at the trend. Is this chart in an uptrend or downtrend? The bullish percent indexes aggregate a bunch of point figure charts and show you one number that tells you what the stocks that make up the S&P are actually doing. Right now, it's around 32% of the S&P in a bullish point and figure chart. You need to get well above there to signal any sort of all clear. Ideally, this indicator gets above 50%. In a bullish scenario, it gets above 70% and stays there. That's what a bull market sort of looks like. A bear market phase is where we're toying around with the 30% range. This is where we've done right now. If you're bullish on stocks, you need these bullish percent indexes to improve. And that's why it might be a really interesting chart to watch now to see during earnings season. Are you starting to get demand come in? That would push the bullish percent index higher and most likely push the major benchmarks higher as well. Chart number two is NVIDIA. This is one of our Menomina stocks, one of the eight leadership names in technology, consumer, and communication services. NVIDIA is a great one because it's a semiconductor name, arguably one of the most consistent, uh, consistently strong semiconductor names, particularly over the long term. When we've done stock picking competitions, NVIDIA usually comes up in that conversation, although not so much recently. And that's why I think it's an, um, uh, an important chart to, uh, to watch. NVIDIA has come down to around 150. If you look to the left on the chart, you see that 150 Uh, 155, 160 have been frequently tested numbers as resistance back here in 2020, 2021, and it's become support here in May and in June. We just broke below there and now testing 160 from below. This is really interesting because as the stock has essentially chopped around sideways, you'll see a bunch of these little uh, days. If you look at a candle chart, you'll see most of those days are closing much above the open. So short-term demand, but not enough to push the price higher. Can this get above the 50-day moving average? That would be my question. Finally, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, other banks are reporting earnings later this week. The question is, do they get enough of an upside boost from a positive earnings win? JP Morgan might be a good one to watch because it's bouncing off the 61.8% retracement level. Does that hold? Folks, that's our show for today. Special thank you to Sam Burns, 
from Mill Street Research, joining us from Boston. For StockCharts.com and Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Have a great night. See you tomorrow. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.